brushes. So there's a lot of confusion about what water brushes are used for. So I thought I would do a comparative video where we have two very similar illustrations. Actually, they need to be swapped. We have a illustration that's going to be painted with brush and an illustration that's gonna be painted with water brush, both of which feature Naomi from my comic, Seven Inch Kara, which you guys can check out at seveninchkara.com. And she is a darker skin character, so we're gonna see a lot of things uh, in this video. We're gonna see how well water brushes work in general. We're gonna see some of the shortcomings. We're gonna see whether or not they can be used as a full replacement for brushes. So I am going to begin with the brush illustration and then I'm just going to reuse that color palette for the most part for the water brush illustration that'll help me save time. So I'm going to erase the pencils from both of these. These were inked with a Sailor Mitsuo Ida, which is a waterproof brush pen. You can also use a Sakura of America Pigma brush, such as the Pigma BB, or really, realistically, a Pigma FB, also waterproof and Copic marker proof. And then I'm going to secure the brush illustration to a piece of backer board. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and check in with you guys. As a little side note, I have several different types of water brushes here. This is not all inclusive. There are many, many more on the market, but these are some of the more affordable water brush types you're going to see. We've got the Jane Davenport with the really tiny brush and then the much larger brush. We've got the Recollections brush pins, which have been going on sale like crazy, so you can get them for a really cheap price. And it comes with a large brush and a chisel brush. There's also a polar flow made by Jerry's Artorama with a larger chisel. I don't have it here because it's very prone to leaking. I had to toss it out. We also have um, your typical Chinese style um, water brush. These are really common on Amazon right now. You can find like a dozen different imprints. I don't want to say brands because they're not actually inventing the technology or bringing anything new. They're just purchasing the license to sell the product, if that, and then reproducing it. And this one is a Sketchbox signature from a couple years ago. So the way most of these work, I'm gonna take a empty one, is they use a glue or a stiffening agent to protect the bristles in transit when they sell it to you. And then you usually can just screw the back off and fill it with water. Some of the nicer ones designed for travel have a little stopper in them. And then there are also, let me see if I have it handy. Karen Dosh makes one that has like a little plunger system. Actually, here we go. I'm actually not a big fan of this one um, just because it has a tendency to leak. So you can fill it up by submerging the whole thing in water and then pulling the plunger, filling the whole body with water. You can also do it under a faucet. You can screw the, the brush off if you need to and it's a lot like a tiny water pistol. And if you need excess water, rather than squeezing the soft barrel, you squeeze this here, the push, which is made of a soft plastic. Most, but not all, water brushes have white synthetic nylon bristles, which can stain, which is why some of these look pretty dirty. I've actually just been scrubbing at them at the sink, but the ones with the most use look the most dirty because they've seen a lot of action. And you also want to be careful to clean out the cap. See this cap is filthy. That's actually going to get onto the water brush and possibly affect the color. So I need to go clean that out as well. The big selling points of water brushes is you don't need to carry a cup of water. Your water is self-contained. One of the drawbacks is that it can continuously leak as you're painting. You may have difficulty controlling your water flow. And even though you're not gonna need a cup of water, you are gonna need some napkins so you can wipe your brushes out and clean the bristles. But it's really a small price to pay for a lot of convenience. Now, does this mean they're a replacement for brushes? Well, we're gonna find that out today. All right, so we are gonna begin with the brushes. I've got my watercolor palette set up. I'm going to go ahead and activate the paint colors that I like to use for her skin tone. And I also need to think of something nice for the background. And it will probably end up being the same color 
that I used for the background in the other piece. So what I was thinking about doing is since I'm doing the brushes tonight, I was going to allow these paints to dry overnight. And what that's gonna do is these water brushes are really intended to be used not with weld palettes necessarily, but with like mixing your colors on the fly and um, mixing your colors straight from the pan, which is why for someone like me, they're just not a daily driver. So hopefully allowing the water to evacuate, evacuate, <laughs> evaporate, from the pans will be a little bit more like what they're intended for. And in general, I'll just try to replicate that experience as best as possible. And I have a cat on my lap now. So move him over a little bit. Don't know if you guys can hear him. I'm actually going to need to grab one more brush. I need something a little larger than this. So I'm going to get a quill. And what I've grabbed, I've grabbed only natural hair brushes. I do also use synthetics, but I really wanted to get as big a difference between the water brushes and uh, watercolor brushes as possible. So I've got a squirrel quill. It's a Harmony Squirrel Quill from Creative Mark, which is a Jerry's Artorama store brand. And we're going to work around the cat. I mean, apply a wash. I don't know about you guys, but I just don't feel like an artist unless I've got a big stupid cat on my lap taking up all the space. He's a jerk. And then I'm gonna use my paper towel here to maybe lift out what would look like clouds and then also use it to remove some of the blue from her face and I'll let that dry. Okay, so we're gonna go in again and try to find some of those cloud edges. So the nice thing about a squirrel quill, and th this is really not an expensive quill. I know some of the nicer quills are pretty expensive, but this was, I, I don't even remember, I bought it years ago from Jerry's Artorama. And um, it's not necessarily the best quill because, it, you know, the metal bits dig into my hand, but it's a decent quill and it can hold a lot of paint, a lot of water, but it doesn't just slap it all down on the paper surface unless that's what I want it to do. Now, of course, you do need a cup of water if you're going to use brushes. And it helps to have a paper towel handy so you can absorb some of the excess paint. But it's really easy to control your water flow. You can dry your paintbrush out on a paper towel and do blending without getting too much bleed, bleed back. And if you have too much water on your paper like that, what you do is you wet the brush, then you dry it out. This makes what's called a thirsty brush, and it's more likely to absorb your paint for you than a dry brush would. And it'll just suck that extra paint and water up off the page without disrupting what you already have, to, already have down. So next I am going to, and this is a series seven. Actually, I don't want to use that one because it's a very nice brush. And what I'm doing is I'm mixing up pigment. So I'm going to use a Creative Mark Rhapsody. This is a Kalinsky Sable brush, a very affordable Kalinsky Sable brush, again, from Jerry's Artorama. And I am picking up some of the colors that I like to use for Naomi's skin. Try to get a fair amount of red in there so that she has a nice warm skin tone. Sometimes, I mean, there are definitely desaturated skin tones, um, more yellow skin tones for sure. Um, she just has a warmer skin tone. So I want to make sure I get a nice base of dark red in there or even red violet. And now that's mixed. Swatch it on a test sheet of paper. 
So what's nice about the brushes is that using a Weld Daisy palette, I can mix up and swatch a skin tone and keep working at it until I find one that works for the character. I think that looks good. So I need the sky to finish drawing before I start in on her skin tone. All right, so the sky has dried. Now we're gonna apply our first layer of skin tone. Ah, I always say that and then I'm like, oh, I should probably shade the eyes first. So I guess I will instead grab a little bit of Payne's Gray first. And what I do is I dip the brush in the water and then I dip it in the pan. And I mean, then you'll get the paint on only the tip. So I'll swirl it around in the Daisy palette. And I know some of this is super obvious for a lot of you, but I'm trying to point out the differences in usages between when I use um, traditional like hair brushes and with water brushes, which might not be apparent for someone who has never used one or the other. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and apply the first layer. And with Naomi, I usually um, apply a layer of her skin tone to her hair as well. And um, it just sort of helps make the process go a little bit faster. And I'm using that Series 7 brush. It holds a lot of water and paint, but comes to a nice fine point. And it doesn't drip water or paint all over the place like a lot of my synthetic brushes will. So I can pick up a nice load of paint and water and fill a large area, even though it's a fairly small brush, rather quickly because it's not dripping and dropping all over the place. And um, this is what, a number five, a size five, which is pretty expensive. It was actually one of my Christmas presents, I believe one year. And then I hoarded it in a drawer for like forever because I have a cat who will eat all of my everything nice. He ruins it all. Um, and then someone finally put the thumb screws to me to use it. So I am using it. It is a nice brush. Um, you don't have to buy the Series 7s. Like I've said in many of my other watercolor videos, the Creative Mark Rhapsody brushes are about half the price. Jerry's often has sales on their Creative Mark products and they're almost as nice, if not as nice, as the Series 7s. So it's a good way to get a really nice brush and also save some money, which I know is a huge concern for a lot of people, as it should be, as it should be. But sometimes I feel like um, Pennywise, Pound Foolish, you know, you're trying to save so much and you're trying to be so thrifty um, and you never get to try anything nicer that might make a significant difference in how you work or your ability to work. And although this is going to end up turning into an artist rant video, um, lately, due to Inktober and sort of um, a lot of feelings regarding that, there's a lot of digital artists who are, um, and when I say digital, I mean they're digital only, who um, really feel like traditional artists look down on them. Um, and they really feel like they have to justify the existence of digital art. And to me, art is art. It doesn't really matter the medium, but I work, I work in both. Um, a lot of what I do digitally isn't really apparent because it's often in correction stages, but I do work in both mediums. Um, however, I get a lot of questions. Well, why traditional or why letter traditionally or why paint traditionally? You can't do X, Y, and Z. You can't you can't easily correct it. You can't easily move things. But you know, there's something about that that I really like. I really like the permanence and even the immediacy. And I love holding an original. Um, so for me, that's definitely a selling point. Another question what, or another statement was, oh, well, traditional is just so expensive. You know what? Same sort of people who say traditional is so expensive really want to have like a $3,000 Cintiq. That's their grail. So I really don't want to hear about how expensive traditional media is from people who want a $3,000 Cintiq. You don't have to have a Cintiq, just like you don't have to have the most expensive art supplies. And you can make wonderful art with inexpensive art supplies, especially if you do your research, which is why people like me do reviews. And that's why we're sitting here today doing this test. So I just... I don't want you guys to think I am saying you have to have 
a Winsor Newton Series 7. You absolutely do not. You, I know artists who do all their painting with synthetics and they enjoy it. And I use a variety of brushes um, at a variety of price points and I make it work for me. So really you don't have to have anything but well, you do have to have something, but you don't have to have any one specific product. It's all about finding the stuff that works for you. So while her skin dries, I'm mixing in a little more of, you know, on the completely other side of the gamut, I'm mixing more of Urban Blue Violet, which is a Soho watercolor. And Soho watercolors are $1.79 a tube, which when you consider artist grade, watercolors are often anywhere from $5 to 20 something dollars a tube is really quite inexpensive. And I'm just going to use, this is a Vermeer Utrecht Kalinske Red Sable. And I do believe that Red Sable is actually a synthetic and sable blend. So when I said I'm only using natural hair brushes, I did sort of fib because that is, that has a synthetic blend to it, but it performs very well and it doesn't have a lot of the problems that many synthetics have in terms of dripping. And it's very economical. Utrecht is, um, it would be like the house brand for Utrecht. Utrecht is now owned by Blick. So very inexpensive way to get a nice brush. And I bring that up because just like um, digital artists are frustrated when other people give them a hard time for their choice of medium, traditional artists are frustrated when digital artists give us a hard time about working traditionally. So hopefully we can all be a little sympathetic and respectful to each other. All right, so her skin tone has at least soaked in. Now I'm going to grab uh, that same red violet that I used as a base. And what I like to do when painting darker skin tones is I like to establish things like, um, like lip shade and blush early and then paint on top of that. And it seems, makes it seem like it belongs to the skin a little bit better. And also it means I can blend it out without um, the paint lifting up which can be a problem with some of the pigments I use. Because we end up using a lot of water. And while I do most of my videos on traditional art, I do want to encourage you guys, if you guys are interested in pursuing art, to try digital art as well. Of course, I'm not I'm not trying to chase you away from that by any means. And I think the more mediums you try, the stronger you're going to be as an artist. So please try to be open-minded and explore things, but also do your research. Um, too many, too many people have given up on watercolor because it didn't work the way they thought it did, but they didn't do any research beforehand. So they didn't really have an idea of how it should work. All right. So I'm going to let that dry that layer has dried. I can go ahead now and do another. And I managed to get a nice, almost dark enough tone the first go around. It's gonna make doing this a lot easier. Sometimes I really have to fidget with the color. But I think I've gotten a lot more confident at mixing my skin tone. And I just go ahead and paint over the red. And you can see it knocks it down in intensity a little bit, but not too much. Clean off my brush in some water, wipe it down, and then blend this a little bit. All right, and then let that dry. So when I'm working on larger pieces, I like to work with two cups of water, one clean and one dirty. When I'm working here at my table, I often have limited amounts of space. So I'll work with one and go and replace the water frequently. If you were doing field sketching, traditional field sketching sets, um, they utilize travel watercolor brushes like this here, where what covered the brush becomes the handle. And they also utilize like folding cups or little screw type cups. And if you guys are interested, I can actually do a video on a couple of different kits that I own. Um, 
And that's what people used before water brushes became so popular and a lot of people still use those. All right, now that her skin tone has dried, I'm actually going to begin painting her dress. And I really like painting Naomi in bright, pretty colors. I think uh, for today's, I think I'm gonna go with a nice compose rose, a very, like it's a very blue pink, but it's a very bright pink. Since even when she's feeling kind of blue, she likes bright colors. So I grab a lot of it with my brush and this is the creative mark I was telling you guys about. And it would be in better condition except my cat has chewed on it. That's one thing that's not gonna happen with a water brush. Your cat is probably not gonna chew on the hairs and ruin it. And I'm going to apply the first layer and as I've told you guys in other watercolor tutorial videos, it's better to start too light than too dark. And so far I've used three different size brushes to get what I want, but I'm also pretty satisfied. It's not muddy, there's no scrubby looking areas and it's easy for me to do fills. No patchiness in drawing and I'm not getting any un desired blooming. So with the brush, I'm having an easy time controlling it. And I specify that because if somebody learned how to watercolor using water brushes first, they might feel differently. They might find that that's the easier control method. So I'm going to start mixing up the shadow tone for her skin. So I'm grabbing a little bit of water. I'll pull out a little bit so you guys can see what I'm doing. I've grabbed a little bit of water here. I'm gonna grab some dioxine purple and then a little bit of naphthol red. And then I'm gonna use a piece of scrap paper and that should be dark enough. So once her dress, well, yeah, once her dress is dried, I can go ahead and paint in the shadow color for her skin. All right. You guys notice that every time I restart the video, I always, it's usually because um, I was sitting elsewhere doing something else and then it's like, all right, settled into my chair now. So I'm adding that purplish color two areas that would either be in shadow or would be the furthest away from the light. And we're still not done. We could stop with her skin at this point, but we're not done. I think there's at least one more layer of skin tone that needs to be painted. But I like to get the shadow color in early for the same reason that I like to get the blush tones in. Just works better with the skin and looks more unified that way. And with the brush, I can pick up some more without adding more water and go over some areas that have dried to darken them up a little bit. So I'll let that dry and I'll start mixing up the color I wanna use for her hair. Since I'm using an abbreviated version of my watercolor set, I'm gonna use some Van Dyke Brown and some black and hopefully that will get me something close to carbon black, maybe grab some sepia as well. We'll go ahead and do the first layer of that. It's a little too washed out, so I'm gonna have to mix it darker. And leave some rim lighting along the top of her hair. And then using a smaller brush. So what we've used four brushes so far, I'm gonna grab some Windsor Newton, olive or green gold. 
And then, since her dress has had a chance to dry, I'm gonna go back in to Compo's Rose. And I'm trying to mix it fairly uh, dark, but I think I may have mixed it too thick. Let's see if I can fix that. So grabbing some of the color I'd mixed in one of the wells, I'm blending out, well, some of the compost rose I mixed in one of the wells. I'm blending out my two intense compost rose. And I am getting a little out of the lines because I'm being kind of sloppy. But the point on this brush is nice and sharp, so really that's just my fault, not the fault of the brush. And I'm going to go blend out those areas up there in a minute. Let me finish spreading color. All right, now I'm gonna get some of the excess off my brush. There we go, all right. And now I'm gonna grab a little bit of straight compost rose and mix it on my palette and I'm gonna go wet into wet without adding any extra water. I'm just adding color, which is something you can do if you're using a brush that you can't necessarily do if you're using a water brush. And I'll let that have a chance to dry. All right, so this has had a chance to dry. I'm gonna go ahead and do a darker layer in sepia. So a big problem I do have with natural hair brushes is I've mentioned my cat multiple times. Um, his hairs get stuck in between, they get in my paints and they get in the bristles of my brushes. Even if I clean my brushes, it's still kind of a reoccurring problem. Um, and it affects uh, the line quality because you end up with like one random cat hair sticking up above the normal bristles. And I'm constantly stopping to pull cat hairs out of my brush and clean them out. So with the water brushes, they do at least have a cap. And like I said, it's something way less interesting to him than these animal fiber brushes that I tend to use, or even the synthetic brushes, because he likes to chew on those as well. So being of zero interest to nosy pets is definitely something the water brushes have going for them. And I'm going to grab a little bit of cerulean blue. Since Naomi has hazel eyes, I'll go ahead and zoom in for you guys. Sorry about that. And I'm going to try and very carefully place it. There we go. And then I'll work really concentrated with the compo's rose. Then we'll just need to finish working on Naomi's skin tone. Blend that out a little bit with some of the color from the well. There you go. All right, now to let that dry as well. So let's go ahead and do another layer of skin tone. We've got it pre-mixed over here. And I could definitely benefit from this color being a little more saturated. Now I could mix it darker and then swatch and swatch and swatch and swatch, or I can step away from the evening and allow it to evaporate and come back tomorrow when it's much more concentrated. Either of those are options with brushes. Just soak up some of the excess 
and blend some of the transitions a bit. All right, and let that have a chance to dry. And while that does, I'm gonna grab a little bit of purple. And I put a little bit too much water down there. And I'm just gonna use that to put in some shadow on her dress. Right, and then we'll see how that dries. All right guys, so this has had some time to dry and while I'm looking at it, I realize I really wanna darken the skin tone on Naomi. So I'm just going to run some more of that purple color just sort of on the most, not extreme, but the areas that would most be in shadow. And then the purple that was used to shade her dress has had a chance to dry. So I'm going to go in with a slightly more saturated purple and tighten up some of that shadow a bit as well. All right, and let that dry. All right, guys, so it is the next morning. My paint has evaporated a little bit. I'm gonna use that to add some details. So I'm gonna take a smaller brush and dip it in the water and just mix my paint up really good because it's had a chance to evaporate, so there may be some separation. And we have a much thicker paint that we're dealing with, which is what we're gonna also use for the water brush set. Now you can, of course, mix colors with your water brush. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna hit a point where I'm doing that for you guys on camera. But I, water brushes are usually intended to be used um, with concentrated color, like straight from the pan color. So I'm gonna try and give it a best case scenario by using some pre-mixed colors that have had a chance to evaporate because water brushes are going to add water. That's kind of the point. So you want to work with something that's already pretty concentrated. Now I will say that that is not how someone who is doing a field painting would be using water brushes. And I think I have a few time-lapse videos uh, where I use water brushes to do some plein air painting. I should also specify that I'm not as adept with water brushes as some people are. I learned how to paint using um, traditional watercolor brushes. So there are definitely artists who can use water brushes as well as they use, as I would use, or another artist would use a regular watercolor brush. And in the blog post that's going to accompany this video, I can link to some of those artists to give you guys a better idea of what I'm talking about. All right, I'm gonna let that dry and I'm also going to reactivate my darker reds. And I wanna go over, glaze over that purple with some of the compost rose that I had mixed with water yesterday. It's evaporated somewhat, so it's a little bit thicker, but it's not as thick as working directly. Well, maybe I shouldn't have done that because it's lifting up that purple. So what I'm gonna end up having to do is probably tighten up that purple. And I'm trying to work delicately and I am using a very delicate brush, um, a sable brush, which is almost as soft as you can get or possibly as soft as you can get. And it's still disrupting that layer of paint. So I'm gonna have to repaint that, but I need to wait and let this dry first. All right, so while that dries, I'm gonna use a really fine brush like this one here. And I am going to grab a little bit of Van Dyke Brown and some sepia and a little bit of black to do her eyebrows. Go ahead and zoom in. Yeah. 
And we're going to start doing another layer of depth to our hair. And when you work super thickly with watercolor paint, it can be a little much for smaller brushes like this. And they have a tendency to dry brush really quickly or they won't even put down any pigment. So you may have to dip in your water and reconstitute it a little bit. And now we're gonna go into those reds. and give that a chance to dry. So that has had a chance to dry. I'm gonna go in and do a little bit of purple shading, not a whole lot. Although this might've been too big a brush to pick. And then I'm going to try to do some hot pink on the neckline here. All right, and then have to let that dry as well. The sky just opened up outside and that's gonna greatly affect how we continue this project. I will try to persist and we'll see how it goes. I'm more concerned for the water brush because that requires a quick evaporation time to be most effective. So we'll see. So I just added some white gouache to my daisy palette. I wanna add a little bit of water to it. I want it to be the consistency of heavy cream. And then we'll zoom in and use this to add white details. And then we'll grab a little bit of reference. Going for a pretty simple daisy print. And then going in and adding smaller daisies. And for the areas that are in shadow, I have a white Derwent and I may have to go sharpen it. But hopefully we can, we can get through. And since it doesn't go down as opaque, hopefully it'll capture that this was done in shadow. All right, so we are finished with the um, brush version of this demonstration. Next up, after this finished drawing, we're going to do the water brush portion of our demonstration. So I hope you guys will keep watching. All right, guys, so this has had a chance to dry. Carefully remove it from our back of board. And I just used washi tape to adhere it. So it's a low tack tape, won't tear things up. And this is what the finished one looks like. And you can check it out maybe in better detail over on my Instagram at instagram.com slash natosoup. So we're going to start working next on our water brush version. I'm gonna go ahead, go ahead, clean up the table, get rid of the water and uh, grab extra napkins. And I'll be right back. All right guys, so here we are with the water brush portion of today's test. And I wish I had a wider flat, I just don't. Um, they do sell slightly wider flats. Um, I just haven't bought one. So what I'm going to end up doing is I'm gonna end up using one of the larger, let's see if this one has been primed yet. There we go. One of the larger rounds. And I'm going to work from this color that I mixed. And one of the ways people use water brushes is they'll use like a flat, clean surface to help mix their paint. So while someone using a water brush probably wouldn't have a weld palette like we're using today, they might work on a tabletop or they might use um, a disposable plate, something like that. 
All right. And this is that blue that we mixed up yesterday. I'm gonna use a smaller water brush. I find it handy to have multiple water brushes going. And that way I don't have to spend time cleaning my brush. I can keep painting. You also wanna have a napkin handy for cleaning. You know, that thing I just said, we don't have to spend time doing. I guess I should have said we don't have to spend as much time doing. Now I have a lot of trouble doing blends and washes with water brushes. I will actually use a travel watercolor brush. And what that looks like is it's just a regular flat with a shortened handle. You could buy them like that, or you can make some of your brushes into that if you so wish. And I am painting on a cotton rag pre-cut paper from Fabriano. It's the same paper I used in the brush demonstration. So what I'm trying to demonstrate is not the paper, but rather the brushes. So I need to keep things as consistent as possible. All right, I'm going to add a little more of the blue in here. Trying to work wet into wet so we can get some nice diffuse blending. I may have overworked it down there. I want a slightly lighter color, so I'm gonna pick some up with the water brush that I was using to blend out and blend that out as well. All right, so um, one of the problems with some water brushes is if you squeeze too much and then you release, it'll suck in air and it can suck in color as well. And that wastes a lot of water trying to get it out of the brush. We're going to be using this brush in a little while, so I'm not gonna bother to clean it. Zoom in so you guys can see what I'm doing a little bit better. And I'll let that dry. Oh, no, wait, there's a whole area down there that we didn't even get, so. And it is really handy that I have this color premix. It's gonna allow me to work a lot faster than I would have been able to, and possibly with more color intensity than I can normally manage. All right, so the top up here is already starting to get a little bit abraded from overworking. You need to keep in mind that nylon bristles like this are actually fairly sturdy. Um, they're not particularly soft, they're very flexible. So um, for gentle working, these are not really great for that. That's had plenty of time to dry. I'm just gonna pick up a little bit more blue. and clean it out on the zoom. Well, you guys can see what I'm doing to clean it out. So we're squeezing a lot of water and then we're kind of scrubbing it against our paper towel or a napkin to get as much of the paint out of the bristles as possible. All right, so next we're going to do our skin. This is actually a really drippy one, so I'm gonna avoid that for now. I'll just go ahead and I guess go with this one. And last night I mixed up a brown and it's still got some water in it. It's not completely evaporated, but we'll go ahead and use it. As you can see, it's starting to water down a little bit. Thankfully, we've got plenty of brown to go around so we can just re-dip it in. But let's say you'd mixed up a small amount of paint using your water brush. You may have just used up all the paint you'd mixed and you would be um, mixing up a new batch while this paint is drying so you would end up with streaking. Unless you really saturated the paper, which you could do. Oh, see, in my haste, I got some onto her strap. Just go ahead and pick that up with a paper towel. Not a big deal. And this is a Niji water brush that I'm using right now. I was mostly using a, or it might actually be a Kurtaki, I'd have to check. Um, 
I was using a Recollections water brush from Michaels before. It's a lot easier when you've got a weld palette and your color is pre-mixed because then you can just use it like you would a regular synthetic brush to be careful not to be sloppy. All right, that is the first layer on her skin down. Go ahead and add in a few shadows here and there since it started to dry in some places. All right, so if we want to blend, clean our brush out a little bit, dab off the excess water. So now we can let that dry. All right, so this has had a chance to dry. I'm gonna grab a smaller tip and I'm gonna grab some red and I'm getting it just directly from, if I can zoom out any, I can show you. I'm just getting it directly from the palette. I mix it here. So it's a little thick and then as you apply it, it gets really watered down. So when you start with a brush load, you end up with a lot of paint on your brush. And then by the time you finish doing whatever you've done, it's decreased like a lot. Basically, I'm trying to say in a roundabout way that you can get really inconsistent results when you pull it up from a palette or a pan. Okay, right, just like in the other one, our brush illustration, I am applying a layer of blush and then I'm gonna paint skin on top of that as well. All right, so need to let that dry. All right, so that has had time to dry. We're gonna go ahead and do another layer on her skin. And as you guys can see, the brown went down pretty, pretty thick. I'm gonna try to blend it out without watering it down too, too much because I don't want a whole lot of inconsistency in color necessarily. Um, I, there are artists who definitely make that work for them. And I am pretty envious of the fact that they can make it work for them. I just have not developed that skill set yet because I mostly use these little water brushes for referenced field sketching, if I'm gonna use them at all, and not necessarily for character rendering. But that might be something worth practicing a little bit more, especially if I have like a dried palette that I could work from, that might be the way to do this, is like pre-make a palette on like, I don't know, like a plate, or maybe like a folding enamel box, something like that with a smooth surface, smooth non-porous surface, I should say, and use that as a character palette. That could be, could be a fun project, could be fun to experiment with. All right, and I'm going to release some of that paint, dab some of that water out, and hopefully blend it without too much bleed back. All right. And then, so a little bit straight into her eye, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let it dry and then I'm gonna try to scrub it out. So her skin has had a chance to dry. We're going to remove this unintentional seepage. So we're gonna wet it, then use a little piece of paper towel. Should mostly come right up. Then we're going to activate some of the shadow purple we mixed up yesterday on the brush test. May have added a little too much water. All right, and you don't wanna go over the area too many times because you'll lift up prior layers of paint because a lot of water brushes will continue to seep paint even if you're holding them very loosely, which is something that's kinda of going on with me right now. You can dab out some of the extra excess water on your napkin, but as you guys can see, it's kind of running anyway. I don't want to say leaking so much as it's just kind of releasing water of its own accord. I guess gravity, it's being gravity fed right now. All right, so 
That is the shadow color. Give that a chance to dry as well. All right, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but the, the paint dried with a hard edge. Not necessarily quite what we're going for. Um, so if I were using a brush, I could use a brush with just the merest bit of water. Unfortunately, I am concerned that given how, how stiff these bristles are, rather than blending out that hard edge, I'll end up lifting up or disrupting the paint. I'm gonna try and we need to let that dry to see if it works. Next, I'm going to do a little bit of shadow to her eye. So grabbing a little bit of the same color blue as we have in the sky. Just gonna do it on the top half of the eye. A little too much, so can I use it? Yeah, so if I make the brush thirsty by dabbing it out on the paper towel, I can pick up some of the excess. Next, I want to do the dress and I wanna demonstrate the chisel nib. First thing I'm gonna do I'll pull out, I'm gonna use Magello Marine Blue. It's one of my favorite colors. Very beautiful, intense sort of marine blue color. And let's try doing this. So when I squeeze this Recollections, Recollections, Recollections brush pen too much, it ends up leaking all over my hand. That's not good, that's wasted water. And if you brought, if you, brought water brushes, you probably didn't bring spare water with you since that's the point of water brushes. So what's cool about these chisel tip ones is you can fill a larger area quicker. And then if you need to do some fine details as we'll get to in a moment, instead of using the flat end, you can turn it so that you get the narrow profile fill in color like that. Of course, every time I put this brush to the paper, it's putting down water because this one's a pretty leaky one. All right, let's clean that brush out and let that have a chance to dry. So we weren't able to lay down a one color wash. It's sort of a model color and it's really pretty like that, but that wasn't the look we were going for. I'm going to go ahead do another layer on the blue because this is also not really the color I had in mind. And I'm still using that chisel tip. Now I should also say that there are water brushes that are um, based off of Sumi brushes. I think they're Chinese design. Um, and I have a few of them and I can test them for you guys. I actually never tested them. I need to dig them up, but we can do a comparison with those at some point as well, if you guys would like. And I think they were more designed for say Chinese um, watercolor or Sumi painting. But just because they're designed for one thing doesn't mean we can't try them for another. Recently, I had a blast doing watercolor using Sumi brushes, which is not the biggest stretch in the world, but just goes to prove the point that, you know, just because something's designed for one use. All right, we're gonna let her dress dry. I found an area that should be darker brown, so once the dress dries, we can go and do that. I'm going to use one of the finer brush tips to grab some Windsor and Newton Green Gold just straight from the palette. Mix it here on my clean surface. Have a little trouble controlling that. Let me zoom in for you guys. The nib has something in it that's making it behave strangely. So I'll finish filling in her eyes. I'll let that dry and then clean up that mistake. Which might have just been a not properly clipped nylon fiber. 
when they made this brush. So it could actually be a production error and not a Becca error, which is nice. Nice for once that it's not my problem and not my fault. Well, it is my problem, but it's not my fault. So I'm grabbing two different reds, mixing them, starting with the brush and ending on my Daisy Well. And I'm going to very carefully fill in her mouth. It's actually a really nice red color. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cap that and maybe save that color for a little bit later. And maybe we can redo her, the blush on her cheeks with that. So that blue has dried. We're gonna go in with the skin tone brown again. Wipe some of this off and get that shoulder that we missed. I think I missed it because I didn't ink it. I didn't delineate it rather in inks. All right, let that dry and clean off that brush. It's gonna bug me. And then using that red that I left on the brush, let's go in and add another layer to her lips and definitely her cheeks. All right, let's clean that brush out. Get the water going to a degree and blend. So, uh, so far, uh, this is definitely workable. I obviously can paint a thing with it, but the lack of control is somewhat frustrating for me. So if I were sitting down and trying to do like a full page illustration, water brushes would not be the way I'd want to go for that. It works in a pinch, but it's not a good solution. There we go. I'd actually put it away. Grab the marine blue. Maybe I want to work directly because it adds so much water to it. This one's a leaky one and you'll get, even with nice brands, like even some of my Niji and Kuretake ones are leaky. I don't know if it's like my hand heating up the water and making it a little more um, liquid, less, not that water is viscous, but uh, it's a problem with say fountain pens, for example, if your hand gets too hot, the ink will become even more fluid and more prone to dripping. And I guess I have hot little hands. <laughs> so that could be a problem with the water brush because I'm trying to hold it as lightly as possible and it's still drippy. The feeling if it were a little bit cooler, maybe that wouldn't be such a problem. I don't know. You guys who are a little more familiar with using them for your art will have to let me know. And that said, if you're one of, if you are an artist who uses water brushes almost primarily and you don't use um, traditional watercolor brushes very often, or if you have like a special unique style that you do with your water brushes and you'd like to share it, please let me know, please link it. Um, I'd love to check out your work. Maybe find a way to feature that somehow so other people can check it out as well. So, um, I think the pink on this cheek is probably a bit much. So we're going to dab some of that up. I may have dabbed up too much there. We'll find out in a second. And, oh, super watery. Come on. Try to reapply it without lifting up her skin tone too much, which is starting to have a little bit of a problem. So I may have to just leave it alone. So that has had a chance to dry. I am going to grab a little bit of marine blue straight from the palette and it's already starting to drip. So we're gonna be really careful. And yeah, I could totally switch water brushes. I've already demonstrated this one. And in fact, after this, I probably will. I will retire this one, at least for now, and clean it out really well, but off camera. So our next step will be to start on her hair. And I've already got a brown prepared from the other piece we did with this. And I may end up having to switch brushes on this one too, because I may have trouble pulling those nice fine lines. We'll see. 
So, probably at the end of this video, I will show you guys what I typically use water brushes for. Um, but something I've noticed is that a lot of my water brush illustrations, especially if I'm in a hurry, like if I'm trying to do um, like field sketching or if I'm at like the botanical garden or something, they end up very, very muted because of all the water that gets added by the brush itself. I'm going to try to do the entirety of this piece with different water brushes. And I don't necessarily have a watercolor style that's really designed for sort of that washed out, muted look. Um, there are many artists who can really make it beautiful and seem to shine like a little gem. That's just not me. I mean, I, maybe I could learn how to do that. I'm sure I could. I encourage you guys to learn stuff. I'm sure I can learn stuff, but that's just not my natural inclination when watercoloring. I have a, a more rendered style. I'm a little heavier handed, which already doesn't necessarily lend itself to field sketching. Although I do think field sketching is super important for artists to practice. And if you can, I encourage you to do that. In a way though, working with the water brush for this has moved a lot faster than the other piece I did because I can't really do as many layers as I would normally do. So I have to work a little, little more conservatively. All right, clean that out and use a smaller one for the next layer. Oh, we've got the teeniest piece that didn't get colored. Let's, let's try to get in there. All right, so I'm gonna put those three to the side. I'm running out of water brushes here, you guys. I'm gonna put a drop in my cerulean blue. Mix it and scrub it to get it somewhat activated. And then delicately try. There we go. Since Naomi has hazel eyes, I like to use olive green and a cerulean blue to sort of capture that. All right, so I'm gonna let that dry and I'll be back. Now that this has had a chance to dry, I'm going to activate some indigo. Get that nice and mixed up and apply it in the shadows of the dress. And squeezing gently because I want this to sort of gradually wash out and I don't know if I can actually accomplish that. And then I want to make her hair darker. So I'm gonna grab some sepia and start working that in as well. Try to be careful around her arm and stuff. Been having problems with coloring outside the lines all night tonight. And I'm using the same sort of motion I use when I use a traditional hair or synthetic brush. Sort of like a little springy motion. And it wants to leak a little bit. So I'm gonna have to be a little more careful than I'd like. Upon close inspection, her cheeks look kind of weird. Maybe I should have done another layer on the skin, either with a shadow color or with a blush or with the, the skin tone base. We'll see what we can do about that after the hair has had a chance to dry. And I find I'm working a lot looser with the water brush than I would with a regular brush. I guess that could be good, it's good for sketching. It can be not as great for illustration though. So I need to let this dry. So while the hair is still drying, I am going to try and find a smaller brush. See if I even have one. Because I need to do the cheeks over again. 
And unfortunately, it seems like all of my brushes are big and drippy right now, which is great. Just trying to sort of hide that harsh transition line that was originally on the cheek. And then reapply the shadow color. Hopefully without disrupting the skin, we'll see. I also want to hit right here. And give that a chance to dry. I'm going to do another layer in the hair and I'm just going to grab some black from my palette and mix it with the sepia. Hopefully I can get it dark enough. And I think I'm just going to save the black for kind of the darkest parts of her hair. Use it a little more judiciously. And clean all that out of the brush. And give all that a chance to dry. Almost done here, guys. And thank you guys so much for sticking with me through this test. I hope it has been informative for you guys. I'm going to add a little bit of shadow to her teeth because I missed that the first go around. So I'm pulling out one of the finer tipped water brushes. And then I'm going to pull out a little so you guys can see what I'm doing. Put a couple of drops into some gouache this was from, I think this morning, it's already pretty much dried out. So I wanna give it a second to absorb that water. And then I'm going to, I guess what I would do, since I don't normally get to use gouache in the field, but it is one of my, the correction slash highlight medium of choice. So I'm gonna use one of my larger brushes. And although this one isn't my favorite, and I actually don't take it out into the field because it's got that plunger back on it and it always tends to get depressed in my bag and then leak water everywhere. But for home use, what's handy is even if I have it full of paint, I can force a lot of that out really quickly with the plunger. Of course, that means I end up with no water and you can redepress, so you can pull it out and then redepress it because you can fill this entire back part with water and it doesn't always, um, when you're depressing it on the first go round, it doesn't always drain from there. So it's almost like you were able to get a double fill. All right, so we've added water and we have stirred it up. So I'm gonna use the smaller of the Jane Davenport water brushes. And I'll zoom in again so you guys can see what I'm up to. And that one little stray hair really affects my ability to ink with this thing or to, to draw nice lines. Little manufacturing defect there. And I could clip it, but I have ruined brushes by trying to trim them before. So it makes me hesitant to correct something like that. Although I wish I'd grab one of my Kuratake small water brushes instead of this one, because this one is not quite behaving the way I would like it to. All right, so I think I am about done. So here we have our brush illustration. Here we have our water brush illustration. Now the water brush had the benefit of the fact that I had pre-mixed the colors the night before when doing this piece. So um, the colors are a little bit darker, a little more saturated. I didn't have to do as many layers, but I feel like with water brushes, they're much harder to control, especially controlling the water. And I wasn't able to do blending quite as easily as I would have liked. If I were doing a larger comic page, I really feel like using water brushes would just not be the right solution for that. 
So I know there are artists, people who are interested in art, who want to know if water brushes are a suitable replacement for traditional brushes. And for me and the sort of work I do, I'm going to have to say no. I still use water brushes. I show water brushes in a lot of the tests that I do. Um, I like to travel with them because they're very compact and it's easy to do fairly clean work with them. But for more layered detailed illustrations, they're really just not what you're going to want to use. You're going to want to use something that doesn't constantly add water to the pigment as you're painting with it. And you're gonna wanna use something with softer bristles that can cover a larger area. And there are slightly larger water brushes, but they don't get a whole lot bigger than this. Um, except for, like I said, those Chinese water brushes that I need to dig up and show you guys. And that could just totally change everything in terms of water brushes. As it is, these are meant to be a portable travel medium that is easy to use, easy to clean, low mess, low maintenance which is fine, but whenever you get a product like that, there are sacrifices that you make. So I am gonna go grab some of the art that I have done while traveling with water brushes to give you an idea of what it's meant to be used for. I have here three small watercolor travel journals. I have a Maruman and two handbook journals, and I use these with a small travel Kuretake set. And these are just sketches that I do in the field. And these are Louisiana sketches. They're for a Louisiana book I'm working on. So this was painted, um, I think I was working from a photo rather than working on location since it's inside a church and it would be difficult to, to do that really and disrespectful if I were doing it during service. So um, I was able to work this a little bit more than I would if I were in the field. And this was also done from a photo. Same here, yet again. So all of these were painted with travel watercolor brushes and water brushes. You can see here where it sort of faded out the color or washed out the color. I believe this one has a couple of pieces that were done, yeah, on location. So this was painted while out in the field and these are on Kilimanjaro paper um, and you can see that I didn't necessarily have a lot of time to build things up so they're just quick studies same goes for this here I'll zoom out so you guys can better see that as well as this this was actually painted I believe that was painted in Nashville and then finally this is also Louisiana stuff so most of these were painted from um, probably, this was actually painted live, which is why it looks so quick and sketchy and kind of gross. Also, I believe painted live. Um, maybe painted live. This was painted from a photo. That's why it's a little more finished out. Still painted with a water brush though, from a photo. These were painted from photos, and I really like these, um, but they were painted with water brushes as well. Same goes for these, still water brush. And these. So for sort of quicker sketches that aren't too detailed, water brush can be just fine but I don't like using it um, when I'm trying to do a more detailed illustration like this one, because it has a tendency to remove prior layers from the paper. Really love how those oysters turned out. I need to finish this book. Anyway, so that was my comparison of traditional natural hair brushes as compared to water brushes. And I tried to make the comparison as similar as possible, utilizing a lot of the same benefits and utilizing the same papers and the same inks and the same character. I hope you guys found this helpful. I know it was a little bit long. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching, so much for hanging out with me today. I, was hope, I hope I was able to inspire some of you and I hope I'm able to answer some of your questions. If you have further questions, let me know in the comments down below. And if there's ever anything you'd like to see me do on 
on air, like anything you'd like to see demonstrated, let me know that as well. I'm always interested in taking your suggestions. So I hope you guys have a great day. I hope to see you again really soon. Bye guys.